After a hot and humid summer, we were looking forward to a trip to mainland Japan to cool off and experience the best of fall. One town that we've wanted to check out is Nikko, which is a small mountain town situated just two and a half hours outside of the mega metropolis of Tokyo. To get there, we first flew from Naha to Tokyo, where we then spent the day exploring Japan's capital city, where 13 million people call home. Since Tokyo is such a huge city with so much to do and see, we knew that we couldn't squeeze everything into a short stay, so we decided to simply spend our first day checking out the all too awesome Team Lab Planets with this interactive museum. The museum requires that you remove your shoes and socks and roll up your pants since there are exhibits that include walking through water. The first large exhibit we entered was incredible. The entire room from floor to ceiling is covered in hundreds of giant mirrors. Thousands of lights dangle from the ceiling, making it feel like you are floating through space. As the lights change with the music, it creates a magical atmosphere. You can't touch the lights though, so we spent most of our time chasing the girls around, trying to keep them from breaking the rules and getting us kicked out. The second large exhibit we experienced was filled with knee-deep water, with projectors casting colorful carp into the water. We were trying to keep the girls from getting wet or drowning, so we didn't spend much time in this exhibit, but it likewise was surreal. As we continued through the museum, we came across one of our favorite rooms. Like the first room, the exhibit is covered with mirrors. The room has dozens of large inflated balls that change colors as the lights shift. Savannah had a blast running through the exhibit, and I had a very difficult time not losing her. We ended our visit at Team Labs by checking out their outdoor exhibits. The first one was a moss garden with these chrome objects that gave the place an otherworldly vibe. Finally, we checked out the nearby floating orchid garden with its thousands of flowers being reflected against the surrounding mirrors. It was a cool sight and a fun way to end our experience at the museum. After enjoying the interactive exhibits, we were beat from our day of travel and fun and headed to our Airbnb in the Shinjuku district of Tokyo where we spent the night and prepared for a trip to Nikko the following day. The next morning, we began by exploring the nearby Shinjuku Gaioan Park, which is one of the largest and most popular parks in all of Tokyo. The park is a relaxing escape from the urban center around it, with its spacious lawns, meandering walking paths, and beautiful gardens. We enjoyed some breakfast there, and got some energy out of the girls before heading to central Shinjuku for our departure to Nikko. Shinjuku is one of the loudest and most colorful districts of Tokyo and is home to Japan's wildest red light district. Unfortunately, I don't speak from experience. Shinjuku has several huge department stores, music stores, electronic stores, and hundreds and hundreds of bars and restaurants catering to every taste imaginable. It is also home to Godzilla, who is ready to wreak havoc and catastrophe upon Japan in a moment's notice. After enjoying our stroll through Shinjuku, we 
we made our way to Shinjuku Station, which is known as the world's busiest train station. Since it serves most of the subway and train lines in Tokyo, the station sees on average three and a half million people per day. That's a lot of trains and a heck of a lot of people. There are 53 total train platforms, making the station difficult to navigate at best, especially for us foreigners. Once we were on the train, we could finally relax and enjoy the ride to Nikko. It took about two and a half hours to get there, and we watched as the metropolis of Tokyo slowly transitioned into the beautiful green Japanese countryside. When we arrived in Nikko, we grabbed some groceries and dinner and made our way to our Airbnb where we would stay for the next few days. Life is a winding road No telling where it goes Our first day in Nikko, we headed up to Lake Chizenji which is situated in the mountains overlooking the city. On our way up, we made a pit stop at the Akechidera Ropeway, which has some incredible views of the surrounding mountains. At the top of the ropeway is a platform with expansive views of Lake Chuzenji, Kigan Falls, and the imposing volcano Mount Nantai. Even if I'm falling down, I will keep on searching for my highs. Fall colors were just starting. As were hungry, tired girls, so we quickly made our way down the ropeway to the small tourist town of Chuzenji, located on the shores of the lake. After strolling through town and getting hot lunch, we checked out the nearby Kikan Falls. The 300-foot waterfall is awesome, and there are platforms at both the top and the bottom of the waterfall for viewing. To get to the bottom platform, there's a large elevator that travels 300 feet through the side of the mountain, which definitely beats taking stairs. Although the view from the lower platform was incredible, our favorite part about being so close to the waterfall was the white noise that promptly put Savannah and Abby to sleep. We even stayed longer just to let them snooze. Even if I'm falling down, I will keep on searching for my highs. You can say I lost my mind, I will keep on holding my head high. Even if the sky is falling down. Later in the day, we walked over to Lake Chuzenji, where we booked a cruise to take us around the lake. It was nice and relaxing to sit back and enjoy the views of the surrounding mountains, including the huge Mount Nantai. The lake was created some 20,000 years ago when Mount Nantai blew its top and blocked the river. It created the beautiful lake and formed Kigan Falls as a result. One of our favorite parts about our stay in Nico was our Airbnb. Not only was our host both gracious and very welcoming, but the home was also beautiful and a relaxing place to stay for a few nights. All right, we got a steamed bun. What flavor is it? Banana? Banana. Banana bun. The best part about the home was the kutatsu, which is a traditionally low Japanese table with a special futon called a shitigake. Either I mispronounced that or cuss, um, you decide, but that's what it's called. An electric heater is attached beneath, which keeps your lower body toasty and warm. The house was always a nice place to come home to, especially when it got cold and rainy outside, because who wouldn't want to enjoy a nice shitty gake?
Our second day in Nikko, we checked out the nearby Toshogu Shrine, which was built in 1617 by the second Tokugawa Shogun. Over 450,000 workmen and artisans labored for a year and five months, night and day, to complete Toshogu. That's a lot of peeps. Since then, Nikko has owned its fame primarily due to this shrine. At the entrance of the shrine, after passing under Toshogu's stone tori archway, is the Go Junoto five-story pagoda. The pagoda is 118 feet high. Unlike our trip to Kyoto, where we were by ourselves for most of the trip, we were lucky to be accompanied by hundreds of local Japanese kids on a field trip with color matching hats to mark their class. It definitely made it feel more exciting because who doesn't love a good field trip? The lavishly decorated shrine complex consists of more than a dozen buildings set in a beautiful forest. Countless wood carvings and large amounts of gold leaf were used to decorate the buildings in a way not seen elsewhere in Japan, where simplicity has been traditionally stressed in shrine architecture. One of the buildings near the entrance of the shrine is the storehouse, which contains famous carvings such as the See No Evil, Speak No Evil, and Hear No Evil monkeys. The main Yomimon gate stands at the entrance of the main shrine. The gate has an unbelievable amount of details and showcases the thought and effort that was put into constructing this shrine. After exploring the shrine with hundreds of little kids, we made our way to downtown Nikko for some lunch. On our way, we passed the famed Shinkaio Bridge, literally meaning sacred bridge, that stands at the entrance to Nikko's shrines and temples. The bridge was built in 1636 and was recently renovated to allow visitors to walk across the bridge, which was not allowed for decades. Cool bridge, Nikko! After getting our sacred on in the morning, we were hungry. We found a bakery and bought some donuts to hold over the girls, so Lisa and I could enjoy lunch at the nearby Zen Cafe, known for its popular Yuba beef sushi. We were excited to try Yuba Sushi. Yuba is a well-known delicacy of Nikko and its surrounding area. Yuba is a food made from the skin that forms on top of soy milk when it gets heated. Instead of sushi wrapped in nori, it was wrapped in Yuba. And instead of soy sauce for dipping, there was soy milk. There was even a side of snail. Delicious! We might pass on the snail if we got it again, but the sushi was some of the best we've ever had. We ended our trip by checking out the Kan Mangafuchi Abyss, which was down the street from our Airbnb. The area is known for its historical trail that travels along the Daya River, known as the Kanman Path. The path was used historically as a sacred trail to the Jianju Temple and is lined by 74 statues with cute little red bibs. The atmosphere at the abyss was both mysterious and beautiful, with the green moss and the river racing through the gorge. It was a great trail and really highlights the beauty of this part of Japan. We enjoyed our short stay in Nikko. It really is a beautiful little mountain town and truly exemplifies the best of Japan. 
From the beautiful natural scenery to the historic Togoshi Shrine, it was a fun place to spend a few days before we started our road trip to Sendai.